the last days, yes, generation after generation has spoken and thought that they were in the last days. Guess what? Newsflash, they were all wrong. Another newsflash, maybe we're right. You never know. What do you think, Barry? Uh, if this is not the last... If this is not the last days, Mike, uh, I'd hate to see what the turn of events would be to, to actually start the last days. Well, yeah, you know, uh, just now that you now that you brought that up, uh, you know, Yeshua did talk about a day that would be like, uh, unlike any other, and there would never be another one like it. So, um, I, you know, I remember thinking back over this, uh, going to growing up in a Baptist church like I did, we didn't have, I don't think we had a lot of talk about the, the last days. In fact, I can't really remember a lot of what we talked about back then. That's a different subject. But I remember sitting in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. It was 1972 or 1973, ancient history. And um, we were a bunch of us, you know, kind of early teens. We're sitting in a park probably doing some things we weren't supposed to. And somebody out of the blue said, hey, did you see that Jesus is coming in, you know, in, in next year? And we all kind of, everybody kind of laughed about it. I, I wasn't laughing. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't in times and all that stuff. And I wasn't really in, into whatever was going on in church. But there was something about that word that just kind of got in me those days. And, and I, I can still remember sitting that, that moment. And so when I came to Messiah back in uh, 86, this whole thing of the last days in this kingdom has been something that's, that's been really a, a infatuation, I guess, with me. I, maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the subject we, yeah, a lot of people would like to discuss now. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about what's wrong with Mike. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this will be a special extended edition. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it may be a little longer than normal, but we'll get through it. Uh, I remember as a teenager being in many revivals. Uh, we had a pastor uh, when I was a kid. It was nothing to have a revival or two every month. Mm -hmm. He believed in having revivals. Uh, and if the doors were open, we were supposed to be there. Uh, but invariably, you're going to get more than a, a small dose of last days. The rapture is getting ready to happen. Oh, yeah. It can happen before you get home Imminent. tonight. Yeah. Uh, On your way home. They, they would preach about... Um, all the people that and the stories that they knew of how someone refused to repent and died within a short time after that. Yep. Of course, it's always a very horrible death. Cars yeah, wrecking it, and being caught up in the treetops and, uh, you know, murdered and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Well, I always thought that bringing, trying to bring somebody to salvation through fear is maybe really not the right way to go. You think? You know, I don't know that Yeshua ever used that tactic. I mean, he was, he yeah. did speak about hell, but he, he did, he invited people to come and to participate in the coming kingdom. Um, so when people would quote unquote give an invitation, that is to come to, down to the front to pray, yeah. we're giving you an invitation not to die and go to hell. Yeah, it was it's uh, what, what it was amounting to. <laughs> it was more termed fire insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you know, those days. Yeah. So the um, the last days was never declared to be a time where the righteous would need to take a stand, mm -hmm. where um, you know the the book that we read mainly about the last days. If we had written it, we might have used the same words, but we would have titled it the revelation of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Instead of the revelation of Yeshua, the Messiah. Yeah. The last days, though they're 
you know, uh, Yochanan, John wrote extensively about not only were there anti-Messiahs in his day, but they were pointing to one that is coming. The anti-Messiah is not so named in the book of Revelation. He is talked about. Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, wrote in, uh, Thess- to the Thessalonians about the coming of the lawless one. Mm-hmm. So all of these figures do describe a anti-Messiah, an anti-Yeshua, a lawless regime of sorts that raises up in the earth and causes most of the earth to follow after. But the book is called The Revelation of Yeshua, These Last Days, it's not about the revelation of evil as much as it is the revelation of the righteous and their Messiah who is coming to bring his kingdom. We need to be so focused, or we may be caught up in something other that is uh, more destructive to us than life-giving. Yeah, and let, let me let me put something in of what you're saying. When you talk about lawlessness, I use the I, I hear this word spoken of and used by various people. And somehow this can take on the connotation of, you know, those that are turning against the Constitution or, or about something like that. Uh, the, the word there would have been Torahlessness. And so I would challenge people that when you see the word law in Scripture, to and, and this does not hold 100%, but for the vast majority of times that the word law is used in Scripture is speaking of the Torah. And so in conversations with people, you can actually use that word of, you know, this will be a day of Torahlessness, which really kind of causes a bit of a conversation to happen you know, regarding, well, what about the Torah? And that's where we should be going to, I believe, is dialogue, opening discussion. Uh, you know, very discussion is something, dialogue is something that we just don't see these days. Uh, you watch the, what, I was just going to point out here, as you're saying that, Mike, we're not saying a couple things. Number one, Torah and law are not synonymous. Torah is teaching and instructions. Yeah. It is the description of the Father's heart and character, and he invites us to adopt that for ourselves. It is also the order of things that keeps the world in order. Yah's order laid upon the earth to keep it functioning as it is designed to function. It's kind of like uh, a computer. It doesn't function if it doesn't have the right chip in it. You take the wrong, you know, you, you change at the processor, but you put a, a, a processor in your computer mm-hmm. that it's not designed to operate with, it's not going to function, at least not correctly. Thus, it is with the Torah. When you take the Torah out of the earth, the earth goes into upheaval. That's what we're talking about. It's not that people are not observing feast days and Shabbat, it's that the overall larger picture of the Torah. They have denied the the set of instructions, the boundaries that Yah has instituted in the earth for all nations, Mm -hmm. not just for Israel, but for all nations. Otherwise, the earth doesn't act right. We're about to see the earth start not acting right. We already see that. It's like, you know, why is why is water cold? Um, You know, you don't have to add cold. To get cold water, you subtract heat. The absence of heat makes water cold. The absence of good is evil. Mm -hmm. The absence of Torah is a is confusion and chaos. So, back back to my statement of of, in this little sideline here of dialogue. Um, There's a, a a television uh, host that, ta- that talked about this the other day, and it's really a, it's a, an amazing concept. We live in a society of, of two thoughts. 
You either have to be over here or you have to be over here. You either have to be right wing, left wing, liberal, uh, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, Torah, not Torah, this, that. There's, there's, no, there's no dialogue between the two. We see that with, uh, with the shots, with the, you know, 9-11. Okay, we've got 9-11 coming up in a couple of days, the, the 20th anniversary. The conspiracies, all right? It's, it's like, well, you're either, you're either totally over here or totally over here. There can be no dialogue between the two. And, and I, I would propose to people that the lack of dialogue will be something that brings forth a word that we actually wanted to go to today in Matthew chapter 24. When Yeshua is sitting there, and I, I just did a teaching on this, on a shame plug, available on my, on my website. I actually coined the title from you, Give Us This Day. Uh, I did not give you credit, but I have now. Uh, it's official. But, yeah, it's official. <laughs> um, so the, the, the concept that, that Yeshua is sitting there with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they start talking about to him about what will happen the, in the last days. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the topic of last days is probably started about the first days. You know, it's been something that the prophets wrote about. It's been some, it's something that the, the disciples knew about. This is not a new topic for anybody. But the, you know, the first thing he did is he pointed them to the, to the temple, that which they had built their whole life on. You know, all of Israel had built, built their whole life on the temple and said, that which you built your life on is going to be destroyed. That kind of got their attention. That's a sobering thought if you put that in today's economy. Yeah, put that into the, the world, you know, what have you, what has a person built their whole life on? Is it the American dream, which is more of the, you know, like the American nightmare? Uh, you know, 2.7 children in a three-car garage. Um, it, you know, that, that, what are people, what is... What have you built your life on? Is it built upon your retirement, your, your 401k, on the stock market, on real estate? What is it? And we're, I, I think I could say we're all guilty of building our, our house on something of, that, that's not the solid rock. You know, we all, we probably all got some, at least a vacation home out there on the, on the sandy stuff that we're not supposed to be building on, you know? Um, those things are going to be destroyed. And what's going to happen in that destruction? The first thing Yeshua says is he doesn't talk about the wars and the rumors of the wars and the famines and the earthquakes and, you know, seven point something earthquakes a day in Mexico and, you know, floods in the, in the Northeast. And, and how does a person drown in a basement when they know a flood is coming? because the government didn't tell them to get out of it. Uh, th these are all things that are, are, are craziness in my mind. But the first thing he says to them, to the disciples is, let nobody deceive you. That's the number one, that was the number one thing on the mind of Yeshua to say to the disciples in that day, let no man deceive you. So our greatest enemy is not the the Taliban getting weapons in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Our greatest our greatest enemy is not the the latest hurricane coming in. The greatest enemy to the righteous, to those that are following Yah, to those that are desiring to follow Him, the greatest enemy to us in our day will be deception. And how do we how do we make sure that we're not walking in deception? You have to know what truth is. Okay, but how do you know what truth is? Well, I was thinking about this yesterday, Mike. Do we know what we know to be true because it's what someone told us? or because we've looked into the word and found it for ourselves. 
how do then even that that how do we trust ourselves to rightly understand what we read? The, it really does come down to a practice of two things. You read this book with an open heart and an open mind and let the, the word get into you. And then you have to pray over it and ask for the Ruach of Kodesh to show you its meaning and its importance to you. Even at that, I you know I, I read something. I think I, I see something. I think I, I'm, I'm hearing something from this. I pray over it. Even after I prayed over it, I still will probably call you, among maybe even some others, and say, "I think I may be seeing something here. Let me bounce this off of you, and see if you can poke some holes in this." And the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. So, I mean, we're striving to find grounded truth. Okay, wait, wait a minute. You're actually telling me that you don't, after you, after you read something and then pray over it, you don't Google YouTube? No. Wow, Mary. How unique is that? Because <laughs> I, would, I would have to... You know, the the most people out there here here's the problem we have a lack of trust of each other because of things that have happened in our lives uh both in in our our, our basic personal life because of things that happen in uh congregational settings religious settings there's a basic tr mistrust of each other Someone will trust something on YouTube and not trust a person that's sitting next to him in a congregation. They'll trust something that's on the television. A commercial on the television, they'll trust that over a person that they know. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just something that's happening in our day that deception is happening. I can show you, I mean, I can take you to commercial after commercial after commercial of, of junk, stuff that's just junk. And but then if, if you present something, something to somebody that's of quality, they, they, well, you're just trying to sell me something. Excuse me, folks, the person on TV is trying to sell you something, okay? They have no interest in you. We, we need to break this, 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 the cycle that's happening right now, Barry, and begin to allow ourselves to trust one another again. That YouTube is and, and and you know whatever whatever service you're using and you know all these kind of things that are out there. YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter is is not the greatest gold mine for truth. You can find what you're looking for. I dare say that I mean, I've, seen, I've seen people that, as you said, they, they've got that formula. They read it in the Word, pray over it, and then be totally deceived. Because they didn't go to somebody that was, that, that was willing to say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I need people in my life, like Barry Phillips, that'll once in a while say, that's dumb. <laughs> okay? You know, because if, if all I'm doing is, is researching something, which is a stupid word for the internet, if all I'm doing is researching something that I've found in scripture, that I've kind of got it going in my mind in prayer, what am I going to do? I'm going to go out and find something that agrees with me. I'm going to find some, somebody out there that may be as totally deceived as, as I am at the moment, but they agree with me. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're just looking for people to agree with you, what if they're wrong too? You know, I, I said this last night, and uh, we had a Yom Teruah meeting together. I said, 
going with the crowd. When name for me the last time that the multitude was right. Name for me the last time the crowd was right. It, it's like uh, never. Yeah, you know I've I've used this so many times. Any dead fish can swim downstream. Yeah. We so, need to we need to be surrounding ourselves with people that are willing and, and then not get offended when somebody says, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. Well, well, I did my research. Yeah, yeah, you agreed with what you agreed with. In the in the multitude of counselors or safety. And the probably the reason for this, Barry, and let me just, uh, this is condemning, I know. The reason for this is because history has repeated itself. There's scripture back, back, backing this up. In ancient Israel, there were many teachers, but few pastors. And the reason for widespread deception in our day is not the lack of teachers, it's the lack of pastors. Okay, well, then two things. One is um, maybe that's the reason that the Father had me about, I don't know, two, three years ago. It's been maybe a little longer than that. I gave a word in um, um, Florida. Um, Lake City. Huh? Lake City. Lake City. Thank you about the call for warring shepherds. Yeah. And in that- Probably that, one of the most anointed messages I've ever seen you give. I, I, when I was finished, I could barely stand up. I was I glad know. to find a place to sit down. Yeah. In that word, I mentioned that we have had a, a, a large number of teachers and that's what's built our movement to this point in, in large respects. And, and good teachers, teachers that have some good words. Yeah. I'm not saying anything against teachers. Uh, this is not I, against teachers. Uh, you know, teachers. I've, I've done that. Matter of fact, at House of David, I went from being a Pentecostal pulpit style preacher to a teacher. And I love to teach. I got my big six by four marker board behind me, and I'd fill that up and erase it and fill it up again. And we'd go hours in Midrash working on stuff. But the father cautioned my heart uh, two or three years ago. So it's time for you to start preaching again. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I realized I don't know how. I don't know how not to teach but rather to preach. And there is a difference. Yeah. My daughters even said, Dad, I would rather you preach. We need to hear the preaching of the word again. And it was just an affirmation. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to, it's not that all preachers are necessarily good pastors. We've had some, you know, as a child, I remember mom and dad talking about, they know how to preach well, but they don't know how to pastor well. Yeah. But there is this need now of shepherding. And what we're talking about, folks, is a, a teacher it has to have something exciting, something fresh, something. I, I, I hesitate to use the word tintillating, but it's something invigorating, some kind of fresh idea in order to capture your attention and hold it. Those who preach and those who pastor and shepherd or more about declaring doctrine, solid, dependable truths that may not be as exciting as the newest, latest, greatest thought, but it's that meat and potatoes thing that will get you sustained and, and grounded and capable of standing in the last day. So I, I would say that a, I would say that a teacher speaks to your mind, and a, a teaching speaks to your mind, and preaching speaks to your spirit. I can I can, I can see that. 
The other thing I was going to mention, Mike, is this, and we talked about this earlier. When the disciples looked at Yeshua and said, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Of all the things that he could have mentioned, the very first thing he said in Matthew 24 and verse 4, take heed that no one leads you astray. Mm -hmm. Deception. Yeah. If you read the book of uh, Yehuda, Jude, if you read Second Kepha or Second Peter, they're saying almost the same thing. Yeah. And they're warning us about those who come in in the last days and lead people astray. Rough Jules' word in Second Timothy to him, again, the same thing. Be careful. Yeah. Preach sound doctrine. To Titus, he wrote, preach sound doctrine. Raise up capable leaders. Over and again, we're being told, guard yourselves. In the last days, there are those that are going to come in with deceptive agendas. And there are going to be those that are going to be excited about what they hear, and they're going to be led astray. Yochanan, the book of John, first, second, and third, he talked about being grounded, being right-minded, not being deceived. Here are the qualifications of those that walk in truth and in light, and here are those that do not. You know, if they're preaching to you and they're hating people around them, they stand in front of you, they give you something wild, fresh, new, and exciting, and then you get along behind the, the scenes and they start cutting other people down and maligning and accusing. Don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. I don't care what, what exciting thing they offer. If the, How can they love Yah and hate their brother? Yochanan said it very, very plainly. You know, uh, you're, you're lying and you're walking in darkness if you hate people. You know, there's some, there's some folks that are on the nightly news, if you would even dare care to think about watching that mess. But there are those who make headlines. I despise what they're doing. I despise their agenda. I can't hate the person. I can see through them and know that they're lying to me. I can know that they're a false person. I can see the darkness on them. But me hating them, you know, it, it does me no good. I hate yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. So much more so than among the family of Messiah. There are those that doctrinally I disagree with. Agenda-wise, I think that they're going down the wrong path. Me hating them maligning and accusing them, slandering them, does no one any good. True, true. When Yeshua, you know, this thing of deception, Yeshua was very specific. When he said, let no man deceive you, he didn't just leave that open to some kind of interpretation. But he said specifically, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah and will lead many astray. Now, I used to see this as many would come and say they are the Messiah and would lead many astray, but that's not what the Word says. The Word says many will come say in, in His name, saying that He is the Messiah. Saying Yeshua is the Messiah. Saying Yeshua is the Messiah, but still lead many astray. So, Barry, this, this brings up a, a, a uh, sink-the-boat topic. Just because someone is standing up and talking about Jesus or talking about Yeshua does not necessarily mean they're speaking the truth. TV's how, full of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, how can, how can we tell? If the, and, and I'm not, I mean, I use the name Yeshua exclusively uh, out of respect for my Messiah. I do not, I do not use the term, the man-made term Jesus 
for him. But this is not about the pronunciation of a term or a name. This is about the character. This goes back to the golden calf. They looked at the golden calf and said, that is Yudhe but it was not. So there was a pe- there were people that were saying the right name, but been t- being totally confused and deceived. So this opens up this question of how do I know that the person that is proclaiming his name is proclaiming the right person? And I, I dare say it, the, the answer is all too simple, and that's why many will be deceived, is that the person must line up with the character. Mm-hmm. And the character can only be found in this book. So no matter what a person is using as a term or a name, if the one that they are proclaiming is not lining up with this book, then they are at least leading you toward a road of deception. Mm -hmm. First clue. Well, I know that we have that book. I know that there's that book, but we have another book. When we have another, and and you, you know, you brought this out, Church of God. There are there's a Church of God doctrinal book, the minute book that contradicts this book. At some points of doctrine, yes. I grew up Southern Baptist. I was Nazarene, Assembly of God, Vineyard. There, there's all kinds of things that are taught that don't line up with this book. You can, we can go to Jehovah Witness, we can go to Mormonism, we can go to a lot of different places. Well, oh, it's, it's all that, but then we have this other book. The first flag to me is when, instead of opening the book, they want to open their book. We'll sit in silence. <laughs> <laughs> Their book cannot supersede the book. So if if a person comes to you and is proclaiming Jesus, proclaiming Yeshua, but all they're talking about is their doctrinal book, instead of bringing him forth out of the book, I have a um, I, I have a piece of advice for you. Run. Mm. Walk away. Walk away. Until until a person can say, no, 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 okay, I, I agree. That book, let, let's just go back to the book. Give me an example, Barry. Years ago, a friend of mine in, uh, in, in Florida, pastor, was leading his Southern Baptist church into a more charismatic style of worship more Pentecostal, charismatic style that was based on uh, some experience that they had received at Brownsville. Um, After church one Sunday, one of the deacons made an appointment with the pastor to come and, and talk to him in his office. So that afternoon before evening service, they, they met in the office and this deacon started spewing all of his stuff on to this pastor, and Henry, Henry, Henry said to me, he says, Mike, he says, I took the Bible, I opened it up to a specific verse, I turned it around, and I said to this deacon, here, read that. And the deacon looked at him and said, preacher, imagine, how, you know, it's amazing how you go from pastor to preacher. He says, preacher, and he he closed the book like this, shoved it back at him and said, this has nothing to do with that book. This has to do with our traditions. (laughs) 
By your traditions, you have made the word of Elohim of no effect. <clears throat> Mike, every one of us have the has the potential to read this word through a filter. Mm -hmm. The filter, as you said, of traditions. There are groups that say, well, we, we study based on the vision or the revelation given to whoever their founder and originator might be. Uh, according to um, our denominational minute book, everyone has a slant. Well, bless God, I'm a fundamentalist, or I'm a charismatic, or I'm whatever. And we use these filters. And the Father uh, gave me an understanding that I was using the filter of an American set of eyes. Yeah. A Western mindset that originally is rooted in Greek and Roman understanding of things. And I was preaching a redeeming Messiah that would fill you with his spirit and heal you and deliver you. And it worked. People got saved. They got filled with his spirit. They got healed. They got delivered. I was functioning at a, at a level that many would say was successful. when the father revealed to me that my eyes were skewed and my vision was tainted, I had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Am I going to, am I going to continue on with what is denominationally acceptable and what my peers and my family would applaud? Or am I going to choose Messiah and his eyes? You have to be real and honest with yourself. And then it, it kind of dawned on me, like, the day that I stand before Messiah, me being denominationally correct according to that doctrine and accepted by peers and family and having pastoral success would be like a filthy rag. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to say to him, I read the word as best I could through your eyes and preached and taught what I believe you say is the truth. And I left the results up to you to heal and to deliver and to, and to, uh, to redeem. I trust you. Yeah. Mike, I have to do this for him, not for anyone else. So my caution to any and everyone watching, be willing to honestly seek him. Am I using a filter or am I reading your word for what it says? And it's a challenge and it's a hard shift. I mean, I, you know, I'm still learning to get previous thinking out and allow him to reveal what is true. And I don't know that that's, not going to be a lifelong process. I think it is. I, I think it's the word of uh, Shaul when he said, work out your own salvation, your own redemption with fear and trembling. And I, I looked at, I actually looked that up in Greek, and uh, it, here's how it translates. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> it wasn't a trick. It, it's not a trick verse. There, There is a, we should be, the one thing in life that we should be serious about is this beginning of this, of this chapter. Don't let anybody deceive you. And that comes through study. That comes through prayer. But that also comes with surrounding yourself with people that will tell you the truth. If you don't have anybody in your life that will tell you the truth, you're in line for deception. Period. Yeah. That's, as we close today, that's another thing I would encourage folks to find. Somebody who would be willing to tell you, no, that's not right. Love you enough 
when, when you tell me, I don't see it that way, let's consider another verse to, to counteract what you're saying. If you were saying that to me, I know that you love me enough to help me stay in balance. We've done that for each other. And to me, that's that's more valuable than anything I have in the office here or anything I own is someone that will tell me, no, that's not right. Yeah. So. You need that person. You do. Or, or people. Or people. The, the, you know, there's a reason that in Israel they do not have a male version of the Barbie doll. <laughs> I'm afraid to ask what that means. He'd be a yes man. Oh. Kin. He fell into the, the, word, the word in Hebrew for yes is kin, so he would be a yes man. <laughs> Don't surround yourself with yes men and yes women. Surround yourself with people that will tell you the truth. Because if we are in those days, you don't want to be deceived. There's no way to go back and and rewrite that after it's all over. Yeah. Good point, but I, I love you enough to eat. That's a bad joke. <laughs> and it's not original. I didn't come up with it. So, I mean, I, told I wouldn't take else. ownership of it either. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Folks, we okay. look forward to uh, hearing from you. Please uh, send us your comments, your questions. Please feel sh- uh, free to share this recording on your social media if you so desire and don't and give me credit for that joke no please don't and uh, <laughs> we'll see you hopefully again next week until then shalom shalom